Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Traverse of the Stars podcast. How are my loyal listeners? And thank you for your continued support. We have an amazing show for you all because boarding the mothership is Andy Diggle and Nick Brokenshire. They are the creative team behind Code Iron, available in Comixology. Now come join me as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Mr. Diggle and Mr. Brokenshire. Thank you so much for coming to the Traverse of the Stars podcast. Thanks for Good having evening. Us. It's completely my pleasure to talk with both of you. I've really enjoyed reading your newest book. Thank you. Oh, glad, glad you enjoyed it. Oh, it's definitely my pleasure. Um, I always like to start off with a question of inspiration. So what inspired your love for comic books? You go first, Andy. You go first. Oh, OK. <laughs> I'll go first. Uh, yeah. Wow. Well, oh, you go first. Yeah. <laughs> it's all going to be, we just can spend half an hour talking over each other. <laughs> right, OK, my, my name's, I've got, I've got a B in my name, so I'll start. Um, uh, well, I. I I was uh, in love with all things sci-fi and weird from a very young age. Um, I grew up watching things like Ultraman and Speed Racer and uh, Battle of the Planets and or Gatchaman, whichever you, you want to call it. And that sort of fed into things like loving 2000 AD and Eagle and, mm. uh, and Batman and all those things. So just from a very young age, obsessed with that stuff. And then 77, Star Wars. It all was one big thing, comics and sci-fi. So there, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Deagle. Yeah, it's much the same for me, to be honest. I think we're a sort of similar generation, aren't we? Um, but like for me, it was discovering 2000 AD when I was 10 years old, because uh, there was nothing else like that around at the time. And it just completely blew me away. Um, I, I think I've been really lucky because um, I kind of hopped from early 80s, 2000 AD, and then I discovered Warrior in the mid 80s. And then I discovered Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. Mm. Um, and it wasn't until years later looking back that I kind of realized I was hopping from like great stuff to great stuff without and kind of missed out everything in between yeah. and it kind of spoiled me for everything else a little bit because uh, <laughs> I, you know when I did then start exploring the wider world of comics when I got older it's kind of like why isn't everything as good as this other stuff I read <laughs> turns mm -hmm. out that I was just really lucky that I just kept hit, hitting these golden ages of great material you know um, but yeah, I think, I mean, I've, I read other stuff before that when I was a little, little, like Asterix, The Gaul and this kind of stuff, which I was a big fan of. I still am, actually. Um, but yeah, like, actually, you know, I, I was, was going to say, Andy, like you, you are probably like me, read things like the Beano and Wizard and Chips and all that sort of stuff. So we, we have a British tra tradition of these like cute little sort of uh, books like the Beano that came out every week, these little anthology things and nearly every child of our generation read those um so we all we were all sort of pre pre predetermined to read comic predetermined predestined whatever um uh, to read comics anyway at that at that era in the 70s and 80s and so like 2000 ad was just the natural i think progression for people of our age i think i don't know but it also felt like such a breath of fresh air as well you know not to denigrate those kids comics but you know they're they're, they're fairly bland for the most part and i, I never really would have called myself a fan i mean you, we'd we'd read them because they were there and we were starved of entertainment in those days those days it was just like you know all we had to play with was a hoop and a stick um jump us for goalposts <laughs> so uh, yeah and then 2000 he came along and it's kind of like boom you know crazy you know really crazy and i think it was it was just formative for a whole generation of, of creators i think they were kind of like wait we could do this you know? <laughs> um and yeah it, it's really inspiring and of course it was the same time you know like star wars was around you know and like you know when you're a kid waiting three years between movies you know that's that's a long wait you know yes it is um but yeah it was it was it was like you know and like Again, it was like mid eighties. We're talking about like, and you know, then Watchmen and you know, Year One and Dark Knight were all coming out around that time. And I was about fifteen around then, you know. So that was a that was a really formative time. And it, like I say, it kind of spoiled me for everything else. You know, I think it's kind of fascinating that you guys mentioned as references Star Wars and Alan Moore, because both Alan Moore and obviously Lucas have their works very steeped in um, mythology. And when I'm reading um, Code Iron, Code Iron, I kind of feel that you also right with an, a sense of history where when you read the story you just feel like it exists in time with a past that already exists not a world you just created for that one issue 
And I wonder if that inspiration is a direct line from what you do to what you've read. That's a really interesting question, actually. Um, I mean, like the Isle of Man is a place that's really close to my heart. Um, but what you're saying about that sense of history being kind of, you know, present in the present kind of thing is very much where I was coming from, actually. We both were, you know, um, I don't want to speak for Nick, but certainly where I was coming from was, you know, um, it's a place where, you know, I, I have family uh, who've lived there over the years, you know, so I spent a lot of time there. And it's it's kind of like a, a kind of rural idyll kind of place, you know, it kind of feels like sort of rural island or something like that. But, the, but you, you know, there are like Viking rune inscribed stones standing in farmers' fields and castles and burial sites, just, you know, dotted all around the place. Um, and it, yeah, it really does feel like the past is kind of alive in the present there. And that's that, that's exactly the feeling I wanted to try and get in the comic, mm. which I think Nick really brought to life. Just that idea of having an ordinary everyday people just trying to get by like we all are. But that kind of myth, not just the past, but that kind of mythological supernatural past is kind of like it's still kind of present in the land and it starts kind of bubbling back out again. Um, when Andy uh, pitched this story to me, he didn't pitch it to me, he told me about the story. I am. Um, I immediately responded to it because for all those reasons, because I grew up in a place like that. I grew up in a very rural, rural part of Scotland and with stone circles nearby and with, you know, ancient castles, like literally a stone's throw from where I, from where I lived. So the moment that I heard this story, I was like, I connected to, I think mm. every, I think every uh, part of sort of traditional British uh, life has its feet or its roots somewhere in a in some kind of mythological thing mm -hmm. you know uh, be, be it celtic be it you know like even just old christian or anglo-saxon stuff um, that there's always a sense of, of of an old thread running through things and for me interestingly enough like um when you say about drawing upon old stuff um like slain from 2000 ad that the, the old pat pat mills run and the mark mark, mark mark mcmahon run like that to me has never left me you know that that sort of touching on old irish uh, mm. mythology and stuff and that combined with uh the actual mythology that you that you'll read about that's i feel that that's part of our little heritage in this story as well you know and going talk you know about your um history and your artwork when I, when you're looking at the visuals of Code Iron, once again, you it does feel once again that you that you did the artwork with a sense of history, but I also noticed that your characters show a lot of history in their faces. Uh, Kay and the grandmother are steep. Just by looking at them, you can kind of almost see a story in them, especially the, in the grandmother. And I was wondering yeah. about when you were approaching the art, if that's just something you're, you're just naturally good at. Was there something that you were definitely trying to focus on in this issue to? connect the steeped in history feeling with the past and like i said that grandmother you can you can see a life in that face well that's good to hear i'm glad i'm glad you say that um i i do i do focus a lot on facial expressions i think that's one thing that um i think in in some comics uh that aspect gets lost a little bit um you know people tend to use stock faces and stuff i use a lot of uh, my own face for reference so I'll take loads of photos of my face pulling faces and you can probably if you look carefully enough you can probably see my face in a few of those expressions and uh, it's just because I, I want there to be realism and because that's the main thing that you look at isn't it faces so mm. um, that I, I focus on that a lot so I'm glad you mentioned that yes so so Mr. Diggle when you're I mean, obviously, um, you've been working with uh, Mr. Brokenshire on this issue. And obviously, like I said, it was fantastic visually, I, the first issue that I read. Um, when you saw the artwork and knew what Mr. Brokenshire was able to do in the artwork, especially, like I said, with expressions, things of that nature, did it allow you to alter or adjust how you wrote the script, knowing that some things would be conveyed just visually in the body language and some things you would definitely want uh, spoken or written? Yeah, that, again, that's a really good question. It's true, because like, you know, we, we, I knew Nick before we started working together, but this, it is, this is the first time we had worked together, you know? Uh, and so it's when, when you're kind of familiar with an artist, like for example, like me and Jock have done a lot of books together or me and Sean Martinborough, you know, we love working together. Um, you kind of develop a sort of shorthand in the script where you don't, I don't over explain because I know that they'll just get it, you know? Um, and it was, it, sometimes I'll, you know, I'll write something, if it's like a big two book, I might not know who will be drawing it. So I tend to put more 
like put more information about the expression on somebody's face uh, mm. in those kind of scripts, just just <laughs> as a sort of safety net, you know. So the acting's there. Uh, but it, yeah, like as soon as I got the first pages in from Nick, especially because that first issue is very character driven. It's before the kind of crazy, sinister, supernatural stuff really mm. kicks in. Um, it is very dependent on on the acting and the kind of understatement. Um, and something I always so yeah that that was really reassuring singing it was like okay no he's got this you know this is working um, and and yeah like when what's something I always try to do on every book is once as soon as I see the the black and white line work and you know see the characters expressions then I always do like a, a fresh dialogue pass um, to see if anything needs adjusting to see that to, to sort of marry the final script to the artwork um, before it goes to the letterer, because it's it's, kind of, it's not fair on the letterer to ask them to redo stuff after the fact, you know, they're mm. going to get paid once. Um, but yeah, but like, it, it was great that I didn't have to do much free writing. Usually it was just kind of just jiggling things around. And usually it was, it was, I could actually, yeah, I could remove some of the information from the dialogue because Nick's carried it in the expressions, you know. Um, mm. I, I really like being able to suggest without explaining stuff about like for example in the first issue there's a bit where somebody's asking Kay about her relationship and she says no it's fine we're fine and you can tell from the way Nick's drawn it that you know she's not fine mm. you know so I, you know I can have a you know the reader's smart enough to understand that you know it's not fine just from mm. the expression uh, and so yeah I, I, I like it being able to you know it's like being able to trust an actor if you're in a movie or a play you know that, that they can they know what's going on on the inside um, mm. And so, you know, sometimes with other artists, you might get a bit where you're trying to do that kind of subtle understatement or ironic thing, and but they've just drawn like they've drawn the character screaming or something. It's like, okay, I guess they're screaming now. So then you have to just <laughs> change it with it, you know, which is fine, you know, because they're, you know, it's a collaboration. Um, but yeah, but it's it's nice when everything just clicks together like this, you know, it just works. So, so when you were developing Code Iron, and like I said, you've known each other for a little bit. What was about Code Iron and what you that you felt? that this was the right time to have partnerships with each other on this comic book? And what did you both want to take away from the comic book when you started working on it? I thought Nick would just get it, you know? Like different different artists are kind of suited to different things. You know, everyone's got, like, I'm I'm suited at certain things that better suited to certain things than others. Uh, but yeah, I just got the sense that, like, you know, Nick's going to get it, you know, get where I'm coming from. And, like, we had that, like, we, we, we first talked about it, didn't we, doing at, this, at a signing at, uh, was it Travelling Man or was it? Where was it? It was uh, in Manchester, Shop wasn't it? Yeah. In Manchester. Um, but yeah, like you, but just, as soon as I mentioned the idea, just your enthusiasm towards like you know the environment and the landscapes and the characters you'd be drawing, it's like yeah, no, he's, he, he, that's that's the right choice. You know? And and the, the fact that like <clears throat> I'd known, I, I met Andy, I don't know, about five six years ago, maybe maybe longer now. But um, and we we'd hung out a few times. We certainly hung out at a bunch of conventions and. I'd been around his neck of the woods a few times and we had talked about there was one time actually where I drew this random Batman thing and you started throwing ideas at me about this weird <laughs> Batman thing and and, uh, and and I was like okay Andy Diggle wants to do Batman Hooray. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that sort of didn't go anywhere obviously but um, in the back of my head I always thought you know one day it'd be nice to do something with Andy but it was Andy that sort of said to me you know, hey, why don't we do something? Because I'd like to collaborate with friends, you know, and uh, and uh, not that he's not friends with his other collaborators, but with people that he knows quite well, you know, mm. and, and that's sort of, that was part of the the initial brew of it all, wasn't it? Yeah. Now having, I mean, obviously you both have worked with many different other creators, both as an artist and Mr. Diggle, at, I mean, Mr. Diggle as an artist and Mr. Brokenstrad, you've worked with people as um, other writers as well. When, you know, what is the, what is the change having that you actually know the person and you're friends with the person this time that you're collaborating with that made the experience different and more beneficial than when you're working for obviously um, mercenary hire? I think that again, it's, it's the shorthand thing, you know, it's, you know, have, you know, sharing the same cultural references or the same sense of humor or something like that, you know, like I say, if I'm writing a script and I don't know who the artist is even going to be, which has happened before now, uh, I tend to kind of, I maybe over explain a little bit sometimes mm -hmm. in the script, um, but just like I say, it's just more as a safety net, but there's a kind of, but when you know the person, then you can have a back and forth. You don't feel awkward about like, you know, for example, you know, you know, not that Nick particularly did this, but you know, if you thought there was something in the script that didn't work, you, you could, I hope feel comfortable getting back to me and saying, you know, okay, this bit doesn't, this doesn't work. How about we try it this way or whatever. And I'm totally open to that. Um, and likewise, you're happy to send me 
layouts and we'd kind of like you know do like a sort of feedback and this kind of stuff and and it's kind of it feels kind of a bit more collegial than than the kind of production line way of doing things where everything goes through the editor and the team don't communicate which i, I never think is a terribly healthy way of doing things i mean sometimes it's necessary because you know deadlines whatever but yeah i think it, the, the, the more you communicate the, the better the end result is because it, it should be a collaboration rather than just you know sausage factory well i i when i read when i read his scripts i just hear his voice like the way the way oh. we're hearing it now. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad, so huh? like, <laughs> No, oh, but it's so it just it was like oh okay you know so it's like having Andy saying you know oh now now she's this and now she's you know so it it, it wasn't difficult at all and um, I I think that we it, it was very smooth in fact I think there were a couple of times when I may have like uh, misinterpreted something and like Andy came back and uh, but because he doesn't have to stand on ceremony with me so he was just like what are you doing? You know, like, sorry, <laughs> you know, pick, pick that, you know, and I'm not going to get offended by it because I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right, you know. But uh, so it just felt, it was very easy, you know. Whereas, you know, sometimes I've worked with some people and I literally, I've never met them. You know what I mean? Never never met them, never heard their voice, never seen their face, you know, and, uh, and everything is purely through emails or from the scripts. And uh, you just go with it, you know, and hope for the best. Um, and then just then you're really relying on on editors, you know, to tell you that something's not right, because more often than not, you don't have any contact, you know, so mm. it's very easy, I think. I think I tend to be a bit blunt as well. So if I don't know the person, I, I've got to worry that they might get offended if I'm saying, you know, like I'm trying to, you know, like make the best comic I can. But like, you know, they might think I'm being a complete asshole because I'm telling them how to do their job, which is probably true. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, the fact is I can't draw, you know, so, mm. you know, uh, like, what do I know? So, but, so is it a good sign that at the end of this comic book, you're still friends? Is that, is that a positive sign that things are well, <laughs> that, you know, you, you know, there's an end of friendship, things are well, that you guys are still talking? At least for the like marriage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, haven't, we haven't been divorced yet. <laughs> we'll see. That's a good sign. That's always a positive sign that things went well. So the story yeah. at least starts on um, Halloween and on the Isle of Man, and I'll probably get the pronunciation wrong. The other man is called Hoptuna. Am I anywhere close to it? Hoptuna, yeah. Hoptuna. So for those of your viewers who don't know, the Isle of Man is a beautiful little island uh, right in the middle of the Irish Sea that's slap bang right in between England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. It's quite, it's pretty small. The whole thing fits on one ordnance survey map uh, and is dotted with old, you know, Neolithic sites and Viking ruins and all, all kinds of stuff. It's a, it's a beautiful place. It kind of feels like kind of like rural island or something like that. Um, it's kind of, uh, yeah, and it's got like a, a strong Viking tradition, a strong Celtic tradition, a strong like mythology of like fairy folklore, uh, all kind of, you know, mixed up together, mm. um, which still kind of feels alive in, in the present day there. Uh, yeah, and like as a kid, I remember hearing about the kind of the whole uh, Hoptuna is what they call Halloween there. And it's like where the walls between the worlds grow thin. And I thought, okay, because I knew I wanted to do something that's kind of feels like a modern day fairy story, but not cute, you know, uh, mm. cutesy fairies. It's kind of like kind of creepy. It's kind of more Pan's Labyrinth kind of vibe to it. Um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, uh, uh, and that's kind of tricky mix to pull off. It doesn't fit neatly into any particular genre. I wanted to get that sort of sense of being hunted. Uh, that you get in a thriller or you know, the Terminator or, you know, a slasher movie, but mm. mixed with that slightly unsettling old magic kind of vibe, you know. Um, but again, like, you know, it's one thing to kind of describe that, but it's a tough thing to pull off visually. And again, that's like, you know, Nick completely nailed it, I think. So, well, I mean, I'll, I'll go ahead. I was just saying thanks. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, I mean, Halloween in the States is a very kind of cute, commercialized, thing holiday i mean um for as not only the costuming but how it's treated uh, for those of us again not familiar with isla man or um hop tuna how is there is it taken more seriously is it um i don't i, I don't know at least uh, maybe less commercialized version of it and why was this version of halloween or Isle of man special for you guys you both well i think that like uh here in Britain, like we, we kind of copy American culture anyway, just a few years later. So the uh, the kind of the whole dressing up tradition of Halloween, it wasn't wasn't something that was huge, you know, when I was a kid. 
Uh, and it kind of like, I remember the first time I saw E.T. when it came out and everybody's dressing up for Halloween. I'm like, what are they doing? Is everybody <laughs> going to a fancy dress party? It just, you know, was, wasn't like a Halloween tradition here back then. And of course it is now. Um, but uh, like with, with the Isle of Man, you know, I kind of like, because it's set in the present day, the story, you know, like it, it, we have got kids dressing up in Halloween costumes because like here in Britain that we, we kind of copy American, American culture, you know. Um, but, you know, I, I love the idea that even though it's kind of like, this, I wanted to have that very stark contrast between, you know, the, the, the modern tacky, we, there's a, like one panel where you see Kay's boyfriend at a Halloween party. And I really wanted that to like feel very kind of you know, commercial and bright and tacky mm. uh, so that that would contrast with that, the sense of being lost in the woods at night vibe, which, you know, on, on, and, and, and that's where you find out what Halloween really is kind of thing, you know, and it's the old, you know, it's Samhain, it's the kind of, it's bonfire night. It's when, you know, the, the dead kind of can, can emerge from the other side or whatever, you know? So, yeah, so it's, it's, it's about it, the, so the, the commercialization of, of Halloween is good for our purposes because it gives us that contrast, you know? Mm. So um, I said, one of the great things in the art, I said the first issue what I, what I love, and I might get the name wrong, and I'm, I'm gonna, I can pronounce a lot of these things wrong. Um, the realm of, I think it's the, the glass tin, tin? Uh, glass tin. Yeah. Glass tin. Oh, I, I, was, I was in the ballpark, I think. So I'm probably pronouncing it. it wrong myself, so I don't worry. <laughs> and, and I really loved how Mr. Brokenshire drew that realm, especially when you see it in that first, that first page of it. So what inspired your, how you envisioned that realm to look? Well, you mean, you, you mean, you mean like when we first encounter the Glashton? Is that is that right. what you mean? Right. Uh, you're right. Um, well, the um, well, that whole that whole section when they're in the forest and they're walking around, um, that that was inspired very much from where I grew up. So, um, well, you know. Andy was inspired by the fact that he'd gone to these places in person. Um, and so his descriptions triggered my memories of where I grew up, which was very, very similar. And uh, in, in those areas, you would have great swathes of blackness where the trees were, but you would also have very like luminescent skies because they're, because they are clear sky zones. So, you know, there's, there's, there's there's no debris in the sky so the, the the luminescence of the sky is extremely bright so you get that green blue thing going on and that's what trisha really brings to life in the colors and so for me all all i was doing was drawing kind of from memory the things i used to remember you know dark very dark shadows stone buildings you know it, they're falling apart and then, but also like with light streaming through from above and through trees and stuff. Um, so that, that's, that's where I got my visual inspiration. I mean, the Glashton, like, just so I can jump in, sorry. Um, the Glashton is actually a creature from Manx folklore as well. It's kind of, uh, I did a lot of reading of old uh, Manx fairy tales and folk tales and stuff. Um, uh, there's, uh, yeah, and it's variously described as like, you know, a goat or a goat-like creature or a hairy man or like some kind of wild man but you know like a fae of some kind and uh but because you know the different stories don't quite align on exactly what it is or what it looks like i kind of i kind of like that because it's meant to be kind of mercurial and shape-shifting and that's you know that's what the other side is like it's kind of it's they change shape and you don't know whether they're friend or foe. They're kind of tricksters and mercurial. And so that, yeah, that kind of, you never quite know what you're dealing with kind of vibe of, uh, can be un unsettling too. Um, and we see more of that whole shape-shifting stuff when, uh, well, I don't want to spoil the story, but you know, we see some, some things that aren't what they seem. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how much time is spent in the realm of the, the glass teen and how much, of these series is spent in the realm of K, Isle of Man, our, our realm. Ooh, Ooh spoilers. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's just say you, you do get to see the other side and it's pretty weird. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like I, I, I gave it a fairly sort of cinematic kind of structure. It's, it's, it's a hundred page story, sort of four issues, or actually just over a hundred pages. Um, but like, so the first issue is, is very much kind of grounding us in the real world and introducing the characters and then things start to get weird and creepy. 
Uh, and so the longer it goes on, the weirder and creepier things get, you know. So, but we've saved all the really crazy stuff for the end of the stories. Well, I think. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I think it. It's sorry. It, it probably isn't too spoilery to say that the 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 people like the Glaston and the the Fey and all those guys, they, their world is seeping into our world somewhat. That, that's what you see in the first issue. So quite a lot of the story is this in between situation where we've got these characters coming into Kay's world um, uh, bef before she before she and other things you know start happening in theirs. But like, uh, yeah, it's it's mainly it's mainly them bleeding into our situation. I mean, is that something that it's, some, no, it's, it's, it's step, stepped around that very carefully then. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> not that slipping. Is that something that is something the glass teeners want to see happen? Is this something that um, is to their benefit, not to their benefit? Is it to our benefit or not to our benefit? This merging? Uh, I guess the simple way of describing it is, I mean, the Glashian is a creature. It's a specific individual creature. Okay. Um, and it's kind of come through to our world for, yes, for a very specific reason. It's, it's hunting Mona. Um, like Kay comes across this girl called Mona who seems to be lost and bewildered and kind of, yeah, it's not quite clear what her deal is. Uh, but Kay's a kind of, you know, she's a good hearted soul and she's trying to help her out. Uh, and Mona is being hunted by the Glashian. It's not immediately apparent at first why, but figuring out why and like, you know, figuring out what's really going on is, is kind of Kay's story, I guess. Well, well, right at the beginning, they mentioned the idea of the Oathbreaker. Now, an Oathbreaker sounds like that individual is the villain because once again, anyone breaking an oath sounds like it's bad. However, is the oath something that they were forced to take? I mean, what is the connection between the issue and the Oathbreaker? And once again, is the Oathbreaker then inherently breaking an oath they were forced to do? And if that's the case, is it really a fair oath to have to take? It's really great having questions where it's clear that you've paid attention to the comic. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that doesn't always happen. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> no, that's an excellent, excellent question. Yes. Uh, well, the thing, like, you know, yes, an oathbreaker is somebody like inherently untrustworthy because they've made a deal and then broken it. But when you make a deal with somebody from the other side, I mean, famously, you know, never make a deal with a fairy because they can't be trusted. They're tricksters. Mm. You know, they, they change the terms of the deal on you. You know, the fairy gold turns out to be autumn leaves and all the rest of it, you know. So you've got to be careful about that stuff, I think is what I will say. <laughs> but yes, the question of who is the oath broker and what was the oath is, but well, becomes pivotal. Could, could you yeah. imagine an oath under duress doesn't count as an oath at all? I mean, if, you're, if, if, if it's being forced, then you would think at some point, if there any inherent contract would, would be, you know, you can count that as... Or, yeah. or you would have to replace it with a new contract. True, very and true. negotiate carefully. So... Uh, you're, 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 you're really delving into the nature, the, the twisty, turny nature of the Fae here, you know, and the, the, the only way to discover who and what the Oathbreaker is, is to try and get to grips with what they're talking about. And that's what this book is about, really, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, it's, it's about like, it's about like Kay's journey is a journey of understanding, you know, because like she doesn't understand what's going on at the beginning of the story. She doesn't understand what Mona is talking about. And then gradually her understanding kind of increases through the course of the story because, you know, she has to learn how to deal with this weird new situation she's found herself in. And so it's, it's coming to understand the terms of, this oath and this deal and all the rest of it and again i'm sidestepping around spoilers here but that's very much the nature of a you know a arc throughout the story now you know um, a lot of western literature especially something of like in biblical terms is always very clear good and evil heaven hell kind of thing are the fae do they exist in a world of good and evil are they just the nature of them is to be this way and we're in determining if they're good or bad I think that they don't fit into that traditional kind of, you know, Manichaean black and white, good and evil type. I'm not, the whole point of the Fae is that they are very much, they exist on the borderline, you know, at the edges of things, you know, that's, you know, we've got this recurring theme throughout it, the, the, the story of, um, you know, the Fae is kind of like, you know, they exist in liminal spaces, you know, like was where, you know, earth meets the sea, where the sea meets the sky, you know, and night meets day. 
and they're kind of they're, they're always just on the edge so they're not quite this and they're not quite that so but that's again it comes back to their mercurial nature you know they one day they might do you a favor the next day they might you know i don't know make your pig sick or something <laughs> you know it's kind of like you never quite know what you're going to get they're, they're yeah. pixie and untrustworthy but you know they can deliver great boons but then they might suddenly exact a terrible price for it so yeah got to be careful about making deals all, all like you know, Celtic mythology and and stories of fairies and fae. That's the that's the the, the central, usually the central, sort of uh, to, direction of all those stories is the the simple thing that you can't know what they're going to choose. You know, you can't know if they're good or evil. They're just always going to pull the rug under your feet. Mm. Sometimes. sometimes you can turn the tables on them if you're smart. You know, there's, there's for all the stories of people who've, you know, been undone by trusting a fae, then there's other stories about, you know, you know, clever Tom or whatever, who managed to sort of turn the tables and beat them at their own game by being, but it's always by being kind of wily and sly, you know, as, as, as wily and sly as they are. Yeah. It, it sounds like there's a great mythology that you, the states just have never delved deep enough into, it, sounds, it feels like. I feel like there's a whole mythology there that we've just been ignorant of. You you get little you get you get little glimpses of it I think um, like I, I was a big fan of the show Supernatural and mm. that was a show that really delved into stuff quite well um, despite you know on the surface being quite a a, a, a dumb show about you know <laughs> two incredibly good looking guys but this the story writing actually was was fantastic and um, they do touch on some of that ancient lore. But not as much as you will get over here. But you know, uh, but they, they, you know, occasionally I've seen the odd bit here and there. The the the, the fairy episode was fantastic from season six. They did a good job. Yeah, with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would appreciate that. Oh, Robert Picardo was great as the uh, leprechaun. Um, I will say. <laughs> <laughs> um, another, like I said, I think another great thing about Code Iron, uh, as we mentioned, the idea of history, and we'll see not only just in the artwork, um, but. I like the idea and the uh, the theme in it of superstitions as well, because superstitions themselves are steeped in history. They're not something that just came out today. They're usually something that has a long legacy of existing. Uh, for instance, and you get a lot of that from the grandmother in the story with the idea of uh, the long tails and you had the horseshoe. So according to the story, um, is superstition then a form of magic? Is it there as protection for us? That reason why we have those superstitions because they keep us safe. Are they more of a, almost like a hindrance or a curse? So in, in, in within the world that you created, how do superstitions exist? Well, again, got to mm. step around the spoiler minefield here. But yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's called cold iron for a reason. You know, it's kind of like, you know, famously, uh, you know, proof against, you know, the against the fae and so on um but yeah like you know kay has been brought up by a grandmother after her parents died and her head's been filled with all of this what she considers to be supernatural nonsense you know like she doesn't she doesn't believe in folklore and superstitions and any of that stuff you know because she's, she's a modern woman um but yeah so part of her learning curve is like oh wait a minute maybe i should have paid more attention to this stuff you know uh, again i kind of i wanted her to be a character who doesn't know she's in a fairy story mm. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I wanted, you know, old gran in the cottage kind of thing is almost a character straight from a fairy story herself. Yeah. It's like Kay was growing up in a fairy story all along, but just never realized because she was so busy trying to get onto, I don't know, stars in their eyes or something like that. You know, she, she's got these dreams of being a singer songwriter and, you know, having her own album and traveling the world. She was never really paying attention to where she was. She just assumed it was a place to try and escape from. Um, and the, yeah, that, that theme of escape is actually something that runs all the way through the story as well. Uh, you know, what, what is it you're trying to escape from exactly? Um, and, you know, yeah. So, yeah, um, let's just say that Kay starts listening to her grand <laughs> when it comes to uh, what's, you know, how, how the supernatural world actually works. So just to go back a little bit to the idea of the superstition as are they, or at least the idea of the mythology that we're looking at, um, rule books to counter magic or they just tradition? A bit of both, I think it's fair to say. Hmm. Yeah. Alex, I really enjoyed that sense of that. And you do, it gives the extra layers of the, of the history there as well. I'll go ahead, Mr. Brokenshire. I was going to say that, like, you know, I think tradition in places like Isle of Man and Ireland and Scotland and, and, and Wales and 
Cornwall and you know like the, the, there are traditions that incorporate those magics into them um, but I also you know like the idea that that they that they make catalog somewhere I don't know if you ever saw the 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 series or read the books of Mr Norrell and Doctor St oh, uh, Mr no. and so good I did not books. but Doctor Strange amazing. would be a hell of a crossover <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah the um, book's that, amazing. That, it really is and like she she created such a incredibly deep and well well fleshed out uh, mythology behind magic and the english magic and things like that and uh i feel that you know it's it, it's it, it would be nice to discover you know that all the things that the grandma believes are written down somewhere you know but uh, but for our purposes it's just traditions Mm. magical yeah, very much like an oral tradition it's not like there's a you know like a, a sort of a church-like authority you know that kind of like you know right. codifies it it's more it's things that are passed down from sort of mother to daughter now once again i'm talking about because we're living um in the within the realm of the story in a magical realm okay um something that i would then ask and that if it was of the nature I, I would ask is the idea of fate um mona um has is found by Kay in kind of a strange way. I um, don't want to go into too much detail, but it's, you know, kind of almost, you, you could argue coincidence or fate, depending on your perception. So with, because we do live sort of in the world of magic, is then fate an aspect of that? The Kay was supposed to find Mona, or that's just coincidence that she was in the right spot at the right time to find her? Well, it's not really coincidence in that, that there's no connection between them, you know? Um... It's not like there's some family connection or anything like that. Uh, Kay just happened to be the person who almost literally ran into Mona and therefore felt responsible for helping her out and de dealing with this problem she has, you know. Um, and there's a point, you know, soon after where, you know, Kay will think that, oh, well, it's that's somebody else's problem. And she tries to kind of brush it to one side. But then her conscience won't let her just walk away. You know, she's worried that, like, Okay, I don't know if they're going to look after her properly. So she kind of reinserts herself into Mona's story to kind of take personal responsibility to help out. Um, and you know whether that's I don't really I don't really believe in fate. I think that's character. You know, she chose. There was a moment where yeah, like random happenstance. She just happened to be the person there at the time when this thing was happening. But she could have walked away. You know. Uh, and, you know, it's one of those kind of like, you know, the Good Samaritan crossing the street kind of thing. It's like she chooses then to go back into the situation to mm. to try and help further, you know, and that that's not fate. That's character. That's choosing to go and try and, you know, help. So, I mean, so is Kay then inherently heroic or is it the guilt of the situation that drives her? What do you think, Nick? Because I've got my own opinions. I'm curious to hear what you think. I think, um, I think that she is, yeah, I think that she is inherently heroic, but not in the sense that, um, you know, she she feels the need to, to go around saving people, but more in that her heart is is such a good heart that she she can't do other than do the right thing because her heart is is compelled to to help this person and that in the in, in you know in very in, inevitably leads to a heroic actions and i think that true heroes are that ones that aren't necessarily seeking you know these adventures you know wars do, do not make one great and <laughs> you know, as a wise man once <laughs> said exactly and um but, you know, it's the ones that, you know, make the right choices. And, and so Kay being a, such a good person, and I, I think she's a very soulful person, um, then that's what makes her be heroic, mm. if that makes sense. I think you put that beautifully. Yeah, no, that, that, that's exactly what I was aiming for. You know, uh, I used to write lots of kind of tough guy action thrillers and stuff like that. And I kind of started to think, okay, it would be nice to start writing some characters who are heroic in a non-violent way. You know, like what, is, what does what yeah. courage actually mean? It doesn't mean you know being more brutal than you know your adversary. It, there's there's other forms of courage. You know, so mm -hmm. like the things I've been writing over the past few years, I've tried to, you know, well, I still like writing the tough guy stuff. Don't get me wrong, you can't beat an exploding helicopter, but um, <laughs> but at the same time, it's you know, yeah, it's a, it's a more kind of quiet kind of courage. You know, it's more mm -hmm. kind of like uh, just choosing to go and do the right thing rather than 
you know, and doing the right thing doesn't always mean fighting somebody. There's other, or, you know, not physically anyway, there's other ways to, uh, to do the right thing. So, so at, at the end of the, the, the issue, without giving any spoilers, Kate mentions that it's going to be a long night. Do this, this, what is the time frame that the series exists? Is it all within a night? Is it to the stretch over to some days? What is the time frame? It's probably, I, I guess there is a bit of a time jump in the middle of it where a few days have passed. Um, but yes, yeah, but like probably over the course of a week or so, I guess, isn't that something like that maybe? Um, there's a few little yeah. time jumps, but, um, and then time starts getting weird. <laughs> um, yeah, but no, but it's fairly short and self-contained. You know, we wanted, mm. uh, it's not like a, a sprawling epic, at least not in terms of time. Um, but yeah, she does get to travel. So um, where can our listeners find Code Iron? And I think you already said it's, it's four issues um, in length? Yeah, it'll be four issues. The first issue is already out, uh, and issues uh, two to four will be released monthly after the, after the first one. Uh, it's currently available on Comixology Originals, uh, the Amazon digital comics service. Um, subscribers to Amazon Prime, uh, or was it uh, uh, Amazon, uh, Kindle yeah. Unlimited, that's what I'm thinking of. Uh, and Prime subscribers should be able to read it for free. It's part of this smorgasbord of graphic novels and comics that, that Amazon kind of lay out for, for Prime and Kindle Unlimited customers. So, yeah, uh, if you like supernatural stuff and creepy thrillers, then go check it out. Or, or if you're not a subscriber, then the first issue, you get like 28 pages. But it's only like $2.99 or something like that. So mm. we wanted to make sure like we did a nice long first issue and not have it too expensive because we want people to check it out, you know, mm. and hopefully you tell me, cause you've only read the first issue so far. Right. So, you know, we wanted to leave it on a little bit of a cliffhanger and make people intrigued to want to know what happens next. Did, did it work? I think it definitely worked. I mean, I like the story. Like I said, I, I enjoy the sense of history that was in there. And I will say the visuals look awesome. I can't give away some of the visuals that show up near the end of that first issue. There's some really badass visuals that, that work. That last really page well. is pretty great. Yes. <laughs> So no, I, I think it's fantastic. I look forward to the second issue. Nice one, thank you. Lovely, right. thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Mr. Diggle, Mr. Brokenshire. It was a pleasure talking to both of you and I look forward to um, reading more Code Iron. Hopefully there's a second um, of... <laughs> thank you, Jeff, fingers crossed. You too, thanks very much.